Limbo. Murder by the Book. The year is 1971. Twenty years before caller ID and the internet, over three decades before the iPhone, public phone calls are made with public telephones. Long distance calls require lots of coins or operator assistance will put it on your phone bill. Cigarette smoking is all the rage. Despite the Surgeon General's warning that it's a deadly carcinogen, smoking is not only legal, but highly popular in most social settings. Business offices, department stores, restaurants and bars, the lobbies of hotels and theaters, even in hospitals. On January 1st, 1971, the federal government bans all cigarette commercials on TV, not for the first time putting public health and welfare at odds with First Amendment concerns. Lighter-hearted news comes in February 1971 when the Apollo 14 mission returns safely her three crew members to Mother Earth, but not before astronaut Alan Shepard practices his golf swing on the moon, about 200 feet from his lunar landing module. September 1st, 1971 is a sad Wednesday for crime fiction readers when it's announced America's favorite literary detective, Mrs. Melville, is about to solve her final murder mystery. After 10 years of breathing life into the widow-turned-investigator, Mrs. Melville creators Jim Ferris and Ken Franklin have decided to call it quits. An angry shouting match at a book signing event two days ago makes it difficult to deny rumors of the two writers' increasing acrimony. Publicly, both artists agree it's high time each man branches out to pursue his own style. But privately, the slip-talking Ken Franklin is a no-talent leech who must now, for the first time in a decade, stand on his own two feet, both artistically and financially, not only in how he puts pen to paper, but more specifically, where. Ken's two-story home in Altadena, California, about 30 miles east of L.A., plus his newly purchased log cabin 150 miles south on the shore of Grants Creek, a cozy, well-to-do little fishing village tucked away in the southern area of San Diego County. Though only a 10-minute drive from San Diego International Airport, Grants Creek's developers were careful to locate this high-society canal comfortably out of earshot of planes taking off every 30 minutes. A perfect home away from home for Ken Franklin, the serene lakeside property is a mecca for the more successful retirees with better-than-average pensions. Former partner Jim Ferris will continue working out of their rented office space on the 10th floor of the Hansford Professional Building in West Los Angeles. Most comfortable with the standard 9 to 5 work schedule, the 40-year-old native Angelino keeps the hours of an average office worker. Then, at the end of each day, Jim Ferris goes home to his beautiful wife Joanna in their modest bungalow home in the Simi Valley. Working in secret, Ken Franklin's first solo project began early this morning. Having typed about two dozen names of known mob associates, Ken folds the paper lengthwise and slides it into the inside pocket of his tweed sport coat. Meanwhile, in West L.A. at the Hansford Professional Building, Jim Ferris arrives early this Saturday morning, not for the first time, delighted to have the entire 10th floor all to himself. Now, under Jim's sole influence, this office lends itself well to the creative process. But for the expansive panoramic view of West L.A., the office itself has as few distractions as possible. Just the necessities befitting a simple, standard office setup. A newly purchased IBM Selectric 2 typewriter. Comfortable fake leather chair. Two standing floor lamps in opposite corners of the room. A coat rack near the door. On the wall, a framed Newsweek magazine cover with Ken and Jim striking their most dangerous pose. Mr. Coffee over in the corner beneath an expensive wall-mounted TV set which is currently turned off until Ken comes to get it and take it with him to his pricey cabin in San Diego. On the other wall, a large framed oil painting on canvas depicting an elderly woman sitting in a well-used wheelchair with a large pink blanket draped over her lap. The iconic detective extraordinaire, Mrs. Melville. Her gaze contemplative and experienced watches as her creator, Jim Ferris, types away happily. Jim cannot see, but ten stories below, Ken Franklin parks his new royal blue Mercedes-Benz convertible just a few spaces from Jim's four-year-old Volvo station wagon. There are two, the only cars in the parking lot. Setting the parking brake, Ken leans to his right, opens the glove box, and takes out a 22 caliber snub-nosed revolver. Cradling the pistol in his hands, 
He opens the chamber, checks it, then snaps it shut and stuffs it in his sport coat's front right pocket. His Mercedes is about 100 feet from the building's entrance. An overly confident Ken Franklin decides locking up is not necessary. As he crosses the parking lot, you can feel the two-pound pistol's wake in the pocket of his tweed sport coat. Entering the building lobby, Ken Franklin ignores the 50-something janitor, steps into the elevator and hits the button for the 10th floor. Upstairs in the office, Jim Farris sits at his typewriter, quietly rereading his last paragraph. Correct grammar can sometimes come across as snotty. On the other hand, Mrs. Melville is no illiterate. Yeah. Yeah. Takes the seat from which Barry Kelso had just gotten up. Nothing snotty about that. Interrupted, Jim Ferris stops and looks up. Who is it? With a frustrated sigh, the writer stands up, crosses the room, opens the door, Ken Franklin's merciless, dead-eyed stare emits no remorse as he coldly raises the pistol and points it directly at Jim Ferris. The victim begins to laugh, but Ken does not smile, and the gun remains aimed at his former partner. Oh, you're not intimidated, huh? Oh, come on, Ken. Are you forgetting that I'm one half of the world's greatest mystery writing team? Standing in the doorway, Jim nods to his friend's grip on the gun. You, uh... Don't have gloves on, your finger's not on the trigger, and there are no bullets in the cylinder. <laughs> Ken Franklin laughs, too. <laughs> You're right. Shrugs, lowers the weapon. I'm a lousy practical joker. What are you doing here with that thing, anyway? I was on my way down to the cabin. I thought maybe I could use it for protection down there. Also came by to apologize. For what? For blowing my cock the other day. I got out of line. Forget it. You know, that happens. No. Shouldn't happen. Ken Franklin drops the gun in his pocket. Not between you and me. So? Reaches down near his ankle and picks up the champagne. Believe it or not, sir. Holding the bottle upside down like he's wielding a club. This is a peace pipe. Ken pushes by Jim in the doorway. Bottoms up, Jim. Walks into the office. In the middle of the morning? Places two glasses on a desk and begins uncorking the bottle. Oh, come on, relax. It's Saturday. And in the mystery writer's soul, it is always the middle of the night. Up! A toast. Ken pours his first glass and hands it to an awkward-looking Jim Ferris. Dear sir? Ken pours his own. I give you... Then raises his glass. Our divorce. Uneasy, Jim sips his drink. Well, not really a divorce. Oh, sure it is. Come on, let's be honest. I mean, it's... Now beginning to sulk. There's no alimony, but uh, it is a termination. Ken puts down the bottle and thoughtfully carries his glass over to the window. He stands near a display table with over a dozen hardcover books, thoughtfully arranged with their titles facing out, easily visible at a glance. Ah, yes. Grazing his fingertips lightly across the hardbound covers. And our dear little children. All 15 of them. 50 million copies. Now standing behind the collection of mysteries, Ken directs his gaze to the framed painting mounted on the wall. With his left hand, he lifts his glass proudly. And to the lady who made it all possible, the greatest sleuth in the world, Mrs. Melville, whom we brought to life, and now we're about to bury. Come on, Ken. You're making me feel guilty. All I want to do is write on my own. Hidden from Jim's sight behind the books. You're right, I am being selfish. Ken's right hand takes a cigarette lighter out of his pocket. Okay, my boy, my blessings on your solo flight. Thanks. I appreciate it. He quietly places the lighter behind one of the books. After all, friendship is more important than partnership, right? Franklin turns to Jim and one last time lifts his glass. Here's to our friendship. Right. Uneasy, Jim sips his drink. And now, sir? Ken puts down the empty glass, placing it near the bottle. Approaches his ex-partner and plants a friendly hand on Jim's shoulder. I'm going to kidnap you. What? The aforementioned cabin, which has been finished for over six months now. You haven't seen it. You're going to be my first male guest. Oh, I can't, Ken. Not now. Oh, why can't you? 
It's all the way down to San Diego. Oh, it's a couple of hours drive. I'll have you home before midnight. Yeah, you know, I promised Joanne I'd take her to dinner and a show. Oh, that's easy. You pick up that phone, you say, honey, I'm going to be working late at the office tonight. Come on, as soon as we get down there, we'll uncork another bottle and we'll go fishing. Well, I... God, you know your trouble, old buddy, is... I mean, you're afraid to unwind even for a day. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, then, prove it. Come on, if you want some justification, you're doing it as a favor for me. With good cheer, but refusing to take no for an answer. At least give me a chance to bury the hatchet with some style, huh? Ken exploits his ex-partner's sense of moral obligation. You just don't drop your partner and then turn down his invitation all in one week now, do you? And eventually Jim Ferris agrees to come see Ken's cabin on the south side of San Diego. Beginning to warm to the idea, a few minutes later Jim turns off the typewriter, unplugs the Mr. Coffee Pot, and puts on his jacket. This actually might be good. Jim always seems to get great ideas when he's got nothing to write with. This time, he grabs his journal, then taps the two pens in his breast pocket just to make sure he's got them. They exit the office, Jim locks the door, and the two men follow the plush carpet of the hallway back to the elevator. Downstairs, Ken and Jim exit the building and walk out to the parking lot. Their car is parked in the distance, the only two vehicles in sight. Actually, the timing isn't bad. I was just finishing the final chapter. Ah, Mrs. Melville's last case. You know we ought to send that broad some flowers. Franklin reaches inside the pocket of his tweed sport coat and removes a typed list. Listen, I made a list of things up that I'd like to take from the office. You want to take a look at it? Jim takes the paper and looks it over. But this is not a list of office stuff. Delgado, Hightower, Battle of Mente. I don't get it. It's a list of names. Oh, I'm losing my mind. It's the wrong one. I must have left the other one at the house. Just before his cigarette touches lips, uh, Ken says, Oh, I am losing my mind. What's the matter? I left my lighter in the office. Do you need it? That's my security blanket. I'll be a minute. When he gets back up to their off, uh, Jim's office, Ken starts by upending two armchairs, a standing floor lamp, and a coat rack. He knocks over the second floor lamp, then, using the bulk of his body, recklessly shoves all 15 hardcover books onto the floor. He takes the coffee pot, pours its contents all over the floor, then throws the machine across the room. He opens every file cabinet, every drawer in sight. Then, document by document, litters the floor with papers of all types. Straining slightly to pick up the typewriter, Ken throws that against the wall. Then, for the coup de grace, he reaches into his tweed sport coat and pulls out the typed lists of organized crime members opens a drawer in the corner and puts the folded page beneath an extra set of keys, Jim's lease agreement, and a few coins of loose change. He picks up his cigarette lighter and uses it for its intended purpose. He walks over to the painting of Mrs. Melville and blows smoke directly in her face. Locks the door behind him, his cigarette half finished by the time he returns downstairs to Jim Ferris in the parking lot. It's a little over an hour later as they head southbound on Interstate 5. Both front windows open. Ken drives, keeping his speed at the flow of traffic. From the angle of the passenger seat, Jim spots the speedometer hovering near 75 miles an hour, about five miles over the speed limit. Jim turns his gaze to the right and looks west, out at the infinite blue of the Pacific Ocean. Behind the steering wheel, Ken smiles. I think I gotta talk you into this trip. Oh, Jim, smell that air. How far is the cabin? Ah, oh, it's that far, about an hour. They have to skirt San Diego. 45 minutes later, Interstate 5 southbound, Ken merges into the far right lane, then makes a smooth junction to Highway 144 east. A two-lane road veers gradually to the left, curving around the south side of San Diego International Airport and further inland. The ocean beach terrain quickly gives way to rural mountain forests, and the smooth asphalt has become uneven, compacted dirt, causing Ken to slow to about 35 miles an hour. The air smells of natural pine, and the distant city is comfortably buffered by acres of green trees as far as the eye can see. Ken pulls off at a single-story wooden building. From the passenger seat, Jim spots a sign between a newspaper rack and an ice machine. Grants Creek General Store. Ken parks the car and sets the brake. I 
I'll only be a minute. I just have to get some supplies. Do you want to hand me that book in that glove compartment? Yeah, it's one of ours. <laughs> yeah. The boss lady is a big fan of ours. I've been promising this for months. Huh. The price of fame. Hey, you want me to come with you? No, no. I'll only be a minute. Jim stays with the cars. Ken carries the hardcover book into the general store. Miss Lasanka! Anybody home? Mr. Franklin! Oh, my planets must be in the right house. Uh -oh. Not only that, but they're working overtime. I have a surprise for you. Ken presents Ms. Lasenko with a hardcover novel. Pour moi? Pour moi. Prescription murder. A Mrs. Melville thriller by James Ferris and Ken Franklin. <laughs> oh, uh, take a look at the first page. You signed it? She quickly goes through the first two pages, then finds the inscription. To my Lily, love always, Ken. You dear man. Well, Mr. Franklin, I'd rather have the storyteller than the story. Well, I'll tell you what, if you play your cards right and give me my grocery list, someday you may have both. Empty promises. Miss Lasanka. What do you need? He hands her a small note paper with a shopping list. Just a few things for overnight, thanks. Loading various items into the basket, the non-extraordinary 40-year-old owner-proprietor looks out her south-facing window, but the way Ken's car is parked makes it difficult to see his passenger. Who is it this week, the blonde or the redhead? Oh, Miss Lasanka. Ken opens his hands. I'm all alone this weekend. He walks to the register, causing Lily to come away from the window and meet him there. Except for uh, some contemplation, some fishing, and a refreshment of my spirit. Could you break this for me? I need some change for the phone. Thanks very much. Wordlessly dropping the coins in his hand. I'll do fine. Lily flirts her very best smile. Thank you. Ken returns with a polite smirk and carries his change into the next room where there's a payphone. Operator, I'd like to place a station to station call to Los Angeles. The area code is 213. you weren't talking to us. Oh, that's all patched up. As a matter of fact, I left Jim at the office a few hours ago. We signed the armistice. Oh, well, that's a relief. Calling Joanna, Jim Ferris's wife know? from Grants Creek, Pardon. San Diego. Uh, Joanna. Ken reinforces the appearance that he is over 100 miles south of Jim, who's presumably still in Los Angeles at the office finishing up his Mrs. Melville book. Fine. Uh, I wouldn't mention it to him. I'm sure he'd like to surprise you himself. Why don't you join us for dinner and we'll celebrate? I'd really love to, but I'm... I'm spending the weekend down here in San Diego at the cabin. As a matter of fact, that's where I'm calling from. All right, then we'll do another time. Absolutely. Uh, Joanna, I thought maybe if you, for some reason, needed to get in touch with me, you do know the number at the cabin. Right. Well, I'll see you in a few days. Fine. Quickly thanking Ms. Lasanka, right. Ken grabs his groceries and returns to the car where Jim is waiting. He puts the groceries in the trunk, gets in the car, and gets back on the dirt road for the last three and a half miles back to the cabin. In the passenger seat, Jim looks at all the trees and vegetation, the beautiful lush terrain everywhere around them. So bucolic, the endless expanse of trees blocks out about half the sunlight. Even though Jim's never been to Grants Creek, there is something strangely familiar about this remote location. Did you ever get a feeling of deja vu? What? Like you've uh, done something before, but you know you haven't. Why? What do you mean? I'm getting it right now. It's strange. You know I've never been here before. Maybe in a previous incarnation, huh? As the road bends to the right, there's a clearing in the trees. Once again, blue sky. And now Jim can see Ken's enormous cabin in the distance overlooking the glistening lake. Ken smoothly pulls into his driveway and parks the car. He sets the brake, and both men exit the vehicle. The 
two-story cabin is much too large for the local area, and at the same time, Jim can't help but be impressed by the splendor of it all. Ken opens his trunk as Jim just stares at this gigantic wooden structure looming over them. Ken, it's fantastic. The house that Mrs. Melville built. Oh, well, you see the inside. Taking out his box of groceries, Ken closes the trunk with a thud. Jim follows behind Ken as the two men approach the front door. As he attempts to unlock it, Ken fumbles a moment with the keys. Behind him, Jim notices it's probably because Ken's still wearing his driving gloves. They're thin, but they do make it difficult to handle keys. He's just about to ask when Ken successfully opens the door, and both men enter the behemoth wooden mansion. Ken begins putting away groceries as Jim scans the spacious living room and sees a burgundy red couch draped in plastic, flanked by two small end tables, one with a telephone, notepad, and pen. There's a wooden coffee table in the center of the floor with two opposing wingback chairs colored powder blue facing the table and sofa. In the far left corner of the room, a stone fireplace immediately left of a large bay window, white linen drapes open, bringing in the light. On the right, in the other far corner, a sliding glass door opens onto a wood deck patio so close to the water one could easily jump right in. It's no wonder. <laughs> no wonder what? Jim puts his notebook down on the coffee table and tosses his jacket on the plastic-covered couch. What woman could resist this setting? Not very many, I promise you that. How many drinks, Jim? More alcohol, no thanks. You'll corrupt me. Oh. <laughs> You're thinking about Joanna, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm just taking off like that. <laughs> she still expects me for dinner. No, we can fix that. We'll put plan A into effect. Pick up the phone and call her. <laughs> what am I going to tell her? <sighs> the man is too square for words. Now, look. You simply say that you're working at the office. You're calling from the office. She knows you have a deadline to meet at the book. You're working late. Oh, how many times have you had to do that? A couple of hundred, I guess. Exactly. That's why she'll believe you. Yeah, you know, I, I just hate lying to her, you know. You're not lying to her. You're saving her a little language. Now, will you pick up the phone and call her so we can start enjoying ourselves? Okay. Jim makes himself comfortable on the plastic-covered couch, picks up the telephone, and calls operator assistance. Oh, operator, I'd like to make a... Hold like it. But Ken reaches over and presses down on the receiver, interrupting Jim's call to the operator. <laughs> It's a cinch you have never cheated on Joanna before. If you want your wife to believe you're calling from the office, you don't have the operator place the call. You dial it direct. The area code is 213. Jim chuckles with what was I thinking, shake of the head. He picks up the receiver and dials his wife, this time direct. Giving his married friend his space, Ken walks over to the fireplace in the corner, standing with his back turned. The husband, speaking on the phone, looks down at the floor as he speaks to his wife. Hi, honey. How are you? Still facing the fireplace, Ken discreetly draws the pistol from his coat pocket and waits patiently as his friend Jim provides his alibi. Well, that's what I'm calling about it. Um, I'm at the office, and I'm pretty well into this last chapter. I'd like to work straight through. Ken turns and aims the pistol directly at Jim. This time he is wearing his gloves, his I finger know. is on the trigger, and there are bullets in the gun. I, I know. Speaking to Joanne... This will be the last time that I can... Jim looks up and sees the gun. Jimmy? Jimmy! Operator, get me the police. A frightened Joanna Ferris tells police dispatch her husband Jim has just been shot. Duped by Ken Franklin's murderous deception, Mrs. Ferris mistakenly tells cops the shooting occurred in Jim's 10th floor office at the Hansford Professional Building in West L.A. All this based on a two-minute phone call? L.A. is a crazy city, and with such little actual evidence to go on, some woman's husband hangs up on her. Police tell Joanna he's probably fine, just had a bad phone connection, and he'll probably be home later this evening fit as a fiddle. But Joanna Ferris thinks differently. 
Scared and anxious, she slams down the phone and drives, in fact, speeds over to Jim's office, hoping to protect her husband or worse, rush him to the hospital if need be. She spots Jim's Volvo in the parking lot and parks her yellow 1969 VW Bug in the next space over. Looking through the glass, no sign of Jim in the car, so Joanne runs inside the building and explains her predicament to the armed security guard on duty, Corporal Sal Chavez. Reluctantly, Joanne agrees to wait downstairs as Corporal Chavez steps into the elevator, hits the button marked 10, then unclips his holster. Joanne watches the elevator doors close, then, like any good wife, she rings for the next elevator and follows the security guard upstairs. Two minutes later, Joanne and Chavez are standing inside Jim's demolished office on the 10th floor. The entire room is in ominous disarray. Both standing floor lamps knocked over, as well as the coat rack she gave Jim last Christmas. Upended furniture and a broken typewriter in the corner. Papers everywhere, on the floor, in the file cabinets, on bookshelves, but no Jim. Obvious signs of a struggle. The phone call in which Joanna heard a gunshot. The building's tenant, Jim Ferris, is missing, as well as his abandoned car in the parking lot. Another call to LAPD, this time from a licensed security guard, gets a more action-based response. Waiting in Jim's office for the police to arrive, Joanna Ferris calls their friend, Ken Franklin, in San Diego. Hello? Joanna? What? Joanna? Will you take it easy? Now say it again once more. Are you sure? Did you call the police? Yes, yes, of course. I'll, I'll leave right away. Uh, Joanna, please, take it easy. And don't worry. I'm sure it's nothing but a practical joke. Goodbye. Meanwhile, at the Hansford Professional Building in West Los Angeles, when investigators arrive a short time later, they declare the office a crime scene, and over the next 20 minutes, a dozen LAPD personnel begin showing up one by one and begin combing Jim's office for evidence, while peppering Joanna with questions that, to a terrified wife, seem totally irrelevant. Maybe he isn't dead. Now, there's no body, no blood. No, he was shot! I, I know it! I, I, I heard... I heard it on the phone. Sure it this place for search, Mrs. Yeah, Ferris. The papers on the floor. Have you any idea why? No, I have no idea why. Maybe so. Did you notice anything? Apparently, cigarette smoking must be a required skill at the police academy. And hoping to minimize the smell of tobacco in her clothing, Joanna briefly steps aside and opens the office door. At the end of the hall near the elevator, two uniformed cops talk to a short guy in a light brown trench coat. She props open the door with the Yellow Pages phone book. Takes one last breath of air, then back to the nicotine haze. Yes. Missing persons detectives try diligently to get as much information as fast as possible, but it's a grueling process, and by this point, the poor woman can barely think straight. Did he say where he called from? Yes, he said he was said he was calling from the office. He said he said I'm I'm calling from the office. I really don't care if anything was missing. I just really want to find out what happened to my husband. Now, it was his voice. I know it was his voice. Yes, that's right. Yes, I would like really please, because. I really feel stupid, and I just really want to clear my head. Okay. Leaving through the other door, Joanne walks down an empty hallway to where there's a water fountain next to an elevator. And now the water fountain's broken. Great. I think that's out of order, ma'am. It's the guy in the trench coat a moment ago talking to the uniformed cops in the other hallway. Uh, you see, that's the trouble with these buildings. The fountains never work. Forty-five years old with Mediterranean features. Then you have to use the coffee machine. He stands 5'7", weighs 185 pounds. And then you lose your dime and the coffee's lousy. He unbuttons his light brown trench coat to reveal a simple gray two-piece business suit, white shirt, black tie. Who are you? Uh, I'm just another cop. My name is Columbo. I'm a lieutenant. Were you, Got were you the proof in there? right here. Colombo shows Joanna his badge and picture ID. You didn't see me in there. And you know why? Because it's so smoky in there and so noisy in there that I just had to come outside and get a breath. Oh, I think I'd better get back. Now, look, wait a minute. He stops Mrs. Ferris with a gentle hand on her arm. Let me tell you something. 
You look very tired to me, and I think you had a terrible experience in there. And I think I ought to drive you home. Let's call it a night. Well, don't you think they want to ask me questions? With a friendly demeanor. Oh, I don't think they'll mind. Columbo simplifies department protocol. I think you've answered enough questions, and I'll call them and I'll tell them you're with me. Resting her hands on the water fountain, she thinks out loud. Okay. Well, what about Ken? Why isn't Ken here? Stepping behind Joanna Ferris, the detective touches the elevator's smooth metal button marked down. I don't know why he isn't here. Is that Mr. Franklin, the other half of the writing team? Her laugh edging on sarcasm. She shrugs her shoulders. Yeah, the other half of the team. Again, Columbo rings for the elevator, then... You know, that's what I like about these buttons. You don't have to push them. They go off with the heat of your hand. Enjoying this fact, he shows her his palms. Then he looks at Joanna's hands. Then the pale complexion of her face. I bet you haven't had any need. Coming up on 4 p.m. now, and eager to get out of that toxic, smoke-filled office, Mrs. Ferris does agree to let Detective Columbo drive her home. Taking the 101 Hollywood Freeway north to the Simi Valley takes about an hour. And following the directions of his passenger, the lieutenant locates the Ferris home and parks his car near the curb. With Joanna's permission, Columbo enters the house first while she waits outside. A few minutes later, the lieutenant opens the door, declaring it safe for Mrs. Ferris to enter. He follows Joanna down the hallway into the kitchen, where she hits the lights, slings her purse over the back of an old, faded green dinette chair, then sits at its matching dining room table with her back facing the living room. Exhausted by the day's events, her head still swimming, she watches quietly as the animated Detective Columbo takes a few items out of her fridge, then grabs a ceramic bowl and places it squarely on the kitchen counter. Unorthodox, to be sure, but a complete gentleman won't even take off his trench coat when he keeps talking about his wife. And of course, under these circumstances, it's good to have a police officer in the house. The lieutenant cracks an egg, then drops its contents into the bowl. Then a second egg. You're a very nice man, Lieutenant, but I'm not really hungry. I'll tell you, Mrs. Ferris, I'm the worst cook in the world. But there's one thing I do terrific, and that's an omelet. Even my wife admits it. Uh, I need something for the eggshells. She points to a cabinet above the sink. Over there in that cabinet. I'm really not hungry. Listen. He opens the cabinet and removes a smaller bowl. Just take a taste. If you don't like it, you throw it away. I'll tell you what the secret is to a good omelet. No eggs, just milk. <laughs> uh, skillet. Over there. Columbo looks where she's pointing. You're a very persuasive man, Lieutenant. Maybe I should hold up my end and make the coffee. Grabbing the coffee pot, Joanna walks over to the sink and turns on the faucet. As Columbo puts the frying pan on the stove, then opens the refrigerator. The cheese and onions and uh, butter. Uh, I need something to uh, grate the cheese. Over there in the cupboard. Right. Columbo locates the cheese grater, closes the cupboard, then returns to the eggs and begins scraping tiny ribbons of cheese into the bowl. What did they do with him, Lieutenant? I don't know, ma'am. Well, there was no body in the office. Couldn't that mean that he isn't dead? Now, that's hard to say. Uh, it's bothering me, too. I tell you, the whole thing doesn't make sense unless it's a kidnapping. Well, you don't shoot a victim first, do you? Why'd you laugh before? What? When I asked you if Mr. Franklin was the other half of the writing team. Um, did I laugh? Yep. Maybe it was the way you put it. Writing team. Maybe I shouldn't say it. But Ken hasn't written a word of a Mrs. Melville novel in years. Mrs. Melville? Who's Mrs. Melville? The character that Jim and Ken created. The one who solves all the crimes brilliantly. Well, uh, why did your husband put up with it? What I mean is, uh, him doing all the work. Well, there were compensations. Ken did the publicity. He went on all the talk shows, and he did interviews, and cultivated the film people. Um, he contributed. He just didn't do any writing. Boy, I'll tell you, I'd love to be a writer. That's a terrific talent. Where do you get all the ideas? Mm, from almost anything. People, magazines, conversations. 
I'm constantly finding scraps of paper and old matchbook covers. Just all over the house with notes and ideas. And those were mysteries too, weren't they, huh? Hmm? They're tricky, I'll tell you that. I could, I could never figure those things out. Well, it got harder. Maybe that's why he decided to go out on his own. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I guess he wanted to do some serious work. No kidding. How did Mr. Franklin take that? Not very well. But he'll get over it. Gee, I hate to be in issues. Why? Well, you got a writing team and they're very famous. Now they break up and what happens? One fellow continues writing books and the other fellow just stops. That's what I keep telling Jim. That sooner or later, people are bound to find out. What, that your husband did all the writing? Hmm? Yeah. Kind of tough on huh? Mr. Franklin's ego. Ten minutes later, they sit down to a delicious impromptu dinner of omelets and coffee. By the time both people finish their meal, it's just after 7 p.m., Joanna freshens their coffee, then locates a large bag of potato chips, which is deemed dessert. She gets up from the table and approaches the door, with the lieutenant three steps behind her. Through the front window, they see a clean-shaven white guy with short blonde hair, whom Joanna seems to recognize. When she opens the door, she instinctively hugs the man in a way that suggests a long-standing family friend. Oh, Joe. Oh, I know, I know. Just take it easy. I drove up here as fast as I could. Columbo hangs back, observing the man's light brown corduroy blazer, maroon turtleneck, and gray slacks. Is there anything you? No, not yet. Joe, it's incredible. I just saw him this morning at the office. Ken steps in and closes the door, where he makes eye contact with Columbo. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. Um, uh, Lieutenant Columbo, Mr. Franklin. How you doing? Well, the question is, how you doing, Lieutenant? Well, I'm afraid we just got started. Has Jim been found yet? Has he been found yet? Uh, why, did somebody tell you he was gone? Lieutenant, I just spent several hours driving up here from San Diego. You must know that this story is on every news station. Oh, right, yeah. Gee, I should have thought of that. Well, has he been found? Gee, I'm afraid not. Uh, no. What, were you visiting friends in San Diego? He has a place there, a cabin. Oh, away for the weekend. Gee, that's nice. Hmm. Could we get back to my question? Have you come up with any leads, any clues? Ah, uh, it's a little early for that. Early? Seems to me your men are standing around just marking time. Could I have a drink, love? I could use one myself. Thanks. I'll tell you something, Lieutenant. See, if Mrs. Melville were on this case, oh, she'd be leaps and bounds ahead of you by now. Humbled in the presence of genius. Is that the lady in the books? That's right. Columbo gives Ken his undivided attention. You see, she would have figured it out that this is not just someone missing. This is a professional killing. As the lesser half of the writing team theorizes using big words and clever phrases about how Jim Ferris was abducted and murdered by the West Coast Crime Syndicate. Columbo admits it is a viable theory, but without actual evidence, it's not enough to assist in a police investigation. But Ken Franklin says if he can just look through Jim's office, he guarantees Columbo he will find something to support his theory. Missing persons investigators have finished sweeping Jim's office for evidence, so now there's no harm in letting Ken have a look. Franklin politely cancels his drink, and saying goodnight to Joanna Ferris, both men agree to meet back at Jim's office about one hour from now. 9.30 p.m. at the Hansford Professional Building in West L.A. Much of the office's disarray has been put back into some sense of order, presumably by janitors, maybe building maintenance. The typewriter's back on the desk, coffee maker on its corner table, broken glass swept up, the two chairs in the coat rack returned to their right side up positions, and the 15 Mrs. Melville books in two neat stacks on their display table. The detective watches as Ken Franklin conducts his own search of Jim Ferris's 10th floor office. The faux novelist makes a show of looking inside various file cabinets, then in and around Jim's desk. He looks in the waste paper basket. Then, in the corner of the office, Ken Franklin spots an inconspicuous drawer. He walks over and pulls it open. 
he rummages through the drawer's contents, moving aside a set of keys and some spare change. He removes a typed page, which turns out to be the office lease agreement. Then, in the same drawer, he locates a second document folded lengthwise. Grinning like a man who's just struck gold, Ken removes the folded page and holds it up for Columbo to see. Here it is. Standing behind Jim's desk, Ken unfolds the paper and offers it to Columbo. Take a look at that. I put it on a desk, just drop it. Because of the fingerprints, you know. My Jim's fingerprints are all over that, so are mine. Ken drops the page on the desk in front of Columbo, who leans in close and looks at it carefully. With a confused look on his face, the detective says, What is it? What's it look like? It's a list of names. Look at that. Musto, Delgado, Hathaway, Westlake. Sound familiar? Uh, yeah, kind of. Well, they should. That's a list of some of the top men in organized crime on the West Coast. L.A., Vegas, Fusco. I don't understand. Well, it's painfully obvious. One of these men had Jim killed. Really? Why? Tell me something. How long have you been a lieutenant, lieutenant? Mrs. Melville would have put that together like that. Well, look, I, I'm willing to take all the help I can get. All right, let me see if I can explain it to you. Ken sits down at Jim's desk with the twinkling L.A. skyline as his backdrop. See, my partner and I decided to split. He looks up at the detective as he speaks. Go our separate ways. I'm sure Joanna must have mentioned that to you. Yeah, she said something about that. Did she also mention the fact that Jim wanted to do some serious writing? Hey. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Wait a minute. Dawning on you now? Yeah. Knew you'd get it. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. You see, Jim was researching a complete and factual expose of all West Coast organized crime. I mean, he was going around asking some pretty embarrassing questions, probing. Columbo nods attentively, fully engrossed in Ken's theory. Compiling dossiers. That's why they searched this office. Apparently, they got everything but that list. And you think one of these fellas put out a contract on him? Ken Franklin waxes gangster. Of course, word must have gotten around that Jim was compiling all this information. They knew they couldn't buy him off. So what did they do? They chose the usual alternative. Professional killing, huh? But if that's true, why did they get rid of the body? Well, who knows? But remember one thing, without a corpus delecti, you can't prove a murder was committed in the first place. But why would a professional killer care? I mean, he's already on a plane back from where he came. Well, son, I can't answer all of your questions. I've given you a list of the most likely suspects, a clear motive. Isn't that enough to start with? Oh, that's plenty, and believe me, I'm very grateful for all the help you've given me. Ken stands politely as Columbo picks up the typed list. Gee, that's funny. The detective looks closely at the creases in the paper. What? Well, this thing is folded lengthwise like someone was carrying it in their pocket. So? Well, if he typed that on that typewriter... Columbo gestures to the IBM Selectric 2. And I'll run a check on that. Why would he fold it up before he put it in that drawer? <laughs> oh, I'm beginning to like you. Why is that? <laughs> because you're finally beginning to think like Mrs. Melville. Unfortunately, Jim used to fold up a piece of paper and he'd use it as a, a bookmark, oh. you know. Columbo rests an unlit cigar in his mouth. Oh. Now, however interesting your observation is, it only leads as far astray. The detective refolds the paper along its creases, then easily slides it into his trench coat's pocket. However, stepping from behind Jim Ferris's desk, Ken crosses the room. Since you are beginning to learn how to emulate our dear lady. Stands near the Mrs. Melville collection and takes the top five books off the stack. I'm going to give you something that you richly deserve. Chance to read some of our books. The detective graciously joins him standing at the table, where Ken puts the five books in Columbo's hands. Well, that's very nice. Uh, uh, didn't expect gifts tonight, huh? Thank you. Maybe I can pick up a few pointers. Oh, oh I'm sure you can. <laughs> Uh, could you handle some more? Ken puts two more books on top. Oh, all right. There you go. Up, the next hey. one. Oh, that's very nice. That ought to keep you busy for a while, huh? Yeah, sure will. The detective is now holding a stack of ten books as Ken puts a friendly hand on his back and guides Columbo to the office door. Well, anything else, Lieutenant? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I'd better let you get some sleep. Oh, that's very nice of you. I just only hope I was of some help. Oh, you certainly were. Well... Navigating the carefully carried stack of books, Columbo hands the man his business card just in case anything else comes to mind. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, sir. Good night. Oh, Mr. Franklin, uh, 
Actually, uh, there is one thing. Not that it makes that much difference. What is it? When Mrs. Ferris called you and told you her husband got shot, you jumped in a car and drove right back to L.A., is that right? That's right. You know, me, I'd have taken a plane. I mean, it's a big airport and they run every half hour. It'd have been a lot faster. Well, I, that's true, but in a situation like that, who thinks clearly? And look at it this way. You add up all the time it takes to drive to and from an airport, how much time do you really see? Mm. Then Colombo departs. Ken closes the door softly, then begins to strategize. Colombo has gotten too close. The body of Jim Ferris is quickly becoming a hot potato, and Ken needs to drop it fast. So, the fake novelist drives back to his two-story home in Altadena on the affluent little cul-de-sac called Skyview Drive. It's just after 11 p.m. when he pulls into his driveway and parks his car. He exits the royal blue Mercedes, innocently walks to the curb, opens the box, and collects his mail from the previous day. Then he just stands there for a moment, taking in the night the way people do. He scans his surroundings, no witnesses in sight at this late hour, and the few nearby homes have their lights turned off. With his own porch light turned off as well, Ken is a darkened shadow as he silently opens the trunk of his car, removes the body of Jim Ferris, and drags it squarely onto the center of his front lawn. He walks back to his trunk and quietly closes it. He looks out once again to the empty little street. Ken mentally implants himself into his lie. Then he takes a moment to get into character. Looking at the body of Jim Ferris, Ken thinks, Good Lord, the surviving writer arrives home to find his friend's dead body conspicuously placed in the center of his front lawn. Surely they're sending Ken a message. Ken takes out Columbo's business card and holds it with his mail in one hand and his house keys in the other as he walks back to the front door of his house and unlocks it. Entering his two-story mansion, Ken turns on the lights and drops his keys on the table. He walks over to the wet bar where there's a telephone and, reading Columbo's business card, he picks up the phone and dials the number. While he's on hold, Ken Franklin looks through yesterday's mail. Lieutenant Colombo, please. Yes, thank you. I'll wait. While holding for Colombo, Ken opens his electric bill from the Department of Water and Power, the city's thieves. Next, he opens his bill from American Express. Finally, an envelope from KBNX TV. They want to interview Ken. Huh. When Colombo comes on the line, Colombo, this is Franklin. Ken coolly tells the lieutenant about the grim horror to which he's just come home. I think you better get over here right away. On the phone, Colombo asks for Ken's home address. 937 Skyview Drive. It's an emergency. Uniformed cops and forensics begin to arrive ten minutes later, and shortly thereafter photographers, both from the police as well as local news services. Standing on the front porch with his hands in his pockets, Ken Franklin gives a statement to Police Sergeant Charles Linus. Working with the body, technicians are aided by large floodlights which turn night into day as uniformed cops strictly maintain a perimeter clearly designated by yellow crime scene tape. Ken watches as coroner's personnel load the body onto a stretcher. Detective Columbo steps out of the busy area and approaches Ken. Ken says, When I got home there, he... There it was, right in the middle of the lawn. Terrible thing to come home to. Standing in the cold night air, the two men continue watching the crime scene. The funny thing is, I... I kept hoping, or I, I was sure that Jim was still alive. Poor Joanna. Every time I think of feeling sorry for myself, I think of how much she had to lose. Neighbors, who until a few moments ago were sound asleep, have donned bathrobes and slippers and are now standing across the street gawking at the police activity. Look at them. Vultures. Lieutenant, you mind if I go inside? I can't stand to watch them 
Gabe. Listen, do you mind if I come in with you? Because there's no binding on this coat. I'm a bit chilly. I don't mind. Uniformed cops have propped open the front door, and the two men walk right into the house. First thing Columbo notices is this house is spotless, immaculate, cleaner than most department store showrooms. What, does Ken Franklin have a maid? Franklin walks over to the wet bar and answers his phone. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Franklin. What? No comment. Ah, oh, you gotta be kidding. What, an interview now? Disgusted, Ken hangs up the phone. The gentleman of the press. Afraid you're gonna get a lot of that. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I'm forgetting my manners. Would you like a drink? Yeah. Maybe a drop of bourbon. Bourbon. Ken walks behind the bar and drops ice into two drinking glasses, then reaches up and grabs the bottle. Boy, this is quite a place. As the detective in the living room regards one of multiple framed oil paintings hanging on the wall. Is this a copy? Hardly. It's an original. Gee, I thought they only hung this fellow in museums. Overhead track lighting illuminates an enormous Oriental Dynasty vase on a display stand. You own this? Mrs. Melville has been very kind. Columbo sidles up to the bar and rests an elbow on its lacquered grain mahogany. Boy, quite a place. Gee whiz. And you got that other place in San Diego. Gee, the upkeep alone must be, uh... I managed to scrape by. You drink. Thank you. Lieutenant faces Ken, noticing the mail and telephone on his right, and on Columbo's left, a small, fragile porcelain statue of Venus. You know, there's one thing about writers that I don't understand. Maybe you can help me clear it up. If a fella's partner dies, uh, does he own the other fella's half of the books, half of the, uh, um... Royalties? Yeah. No. They go into the deceased's estate. Mm. That leaves you on the cold, doesn't it? Unless, of course, you insured each other. Lieutenant, aren't we going a bit far astray? You're right. We shouldn't be talking about this now. It's not the time. Ken steps out of the bar well, uh, and the two men slowly carry their drinks into the living room. So, Mr. Franklin, tell me, uh, why do you think that they left your partner's body out there on the lawn like that? Do you mean to tell me you haven't figured that out? Lieutenant, you disappoint me. It was left as a warning. A warning? Of course. Ken sits down in the plush, wine-color armchair as the detective remains standing. It also proves my theory about it being a professional killing. See, the moment they drop Jim's body in the middle of that lawn, I... Please, sit down. The lieutenant relaxes down into a light brown sofa, and the two men now sit facing each other. The moment they drop Jim's body... You know what they were saying? That this could happen to you. Unless you stop in your partner's research. They're trying to scare you. Exactly. Right. So what are you going to do? You going to continue writing the book anyway? No, that's the irony of it. You see, that was Jim's pet project, not mine. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to begin. Say, I guess they didn't have any way of knowing you two were going to split up. Nah. Even if they did, it wouldn't have done Jim any good. I must say, Lieutenant, you're up against a dead end. The failed writer leans forward, resting elbows on his knees. Look at this. Ken ticks off with his fingers. You got a body? You got a motive? But you're never going to find that killer. Columbo notices an expensive gold pinky ring on Ken's right hand. It's not going to be easy. I'll leave you five to one. It was someone in Las Vegas or Miami. Ken aims his finger like a gun. Picked up a phone and... Right. Put out a contract. Right. How are you going to make a case much less... Solve one is beyond me. You no, know, I guess the only thing I can do is just check out every name on that list. Sure. You know what's going to happen? Every one of those guys is going to deny that Jim even existed. Right. I must say, I don't envy you. I don't envy myself. Now, look, I got a lot of phone calls to make. I'd better get on it, huh? Ken reaches his right hand forward, and the two men shake hands. All the luck. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mr. Franklin. Columbo stands as Ken remains seated. Both men have expressions of great concern. And listen, I'm very sorry about what happened tonight. Thank you. Right. Lieutenant takes his empty glass back to the bar. You, uh, you will keep me posted, Lieutenant. 
as he sets it down. Oh, yes, I will, yeah. Columbo spots his own business card near the telephone and the open mail. You know, there's only one thing that I'm not clear about. But that can wait. You want to go to bed. Lieutenant, I'm not going to get any sleep anyway. What is it? Would you go over for me once again? I know you did it. Exactly what happened when you came home tonight. Still in his living room. Sure, I, I've already told you, but... The 45-year-old stands up uncertainly and makes his way over to the bar where Columbo is standing. <sighs> the moment I saw Jim's body in the middle of the lawn, I came running in here and I picked up the phone and I called you. I mean, it's a purely reflexive action. Uh-huh. Right. Folding his arms, the detective rubs his eyebrow like he's trying to work out a math problem. Yeah, that's fine. Now, wait a minute. You, you look like you're troubled. Is there some reason for your question? Uh, it's your mail. My mail? Isn't it funny how people are different? Now, me, if I found my partner dead, I'd never think of opening my letters. But I... I, I just did it to distract myself. I mean, you gotta remember one thing. That's a great shock. Yeah. Oh, that's understandable. And bills are distracting. Listen, if anything comes up, I'll call you right away. Good night. Good night. As Columbo takes his leave, Ken can hear himself swallow as he closes the door. On his drive home, Columbo replays the conversation in his head, and the detective smiles. Ken Franklin changed the subject pretty fast when Columbo brought up life insurance policies. The following Monday morning, the lieutenant puts in phone calls to the L.A. County Hall of Records and the L.A. County Registrar's Office. A day's worth of bureaucratic digging reveals a life insurance policy was taken out, providing coverage maintained by and for Ken Franklin and James Ferris. The specifics of the policy are confidential, and the only useful information is the agent on record and his business phone number. So the lieutenant calls insurance agent Elliot Tucker, and the two men agree to meet the following day. The iconic L.A. hot dog stand, actually shaped like a giant hot dog on a bun, Tail of the Pup is located at the busy intersection of San Vicente and La Cienega. Both arriving ten minutes early, Columbo and Elliot Tucker park and exit their cars. Columbo identifies himself with a wave of a hand, and the friendly, egg-shaped insurance agent, Elliot Tucker, returns the gesture. I'm gonna have a hot dog. Well, I guess I will, too. Mr. Tucker is a heavy-set white guy who stands 5'7", weighs 240 pounds. The cook inside puts before them two huge, delicious-smelling hot dogs, and when Elliot Tucker reaches for his wallet... No, no, Mr. Tucker, you put that away. This one's on me. With a thin black portfolio wedged under his left arm, the balding 55-year-old wears a dark gray pinstripe suit over a white shirt with a necktie of blue silk. Colombo says to the cook, May I have a receipt, please? The detective settles the bill. Then, with rehearsed practice, both hungry men coordinate their napkins, condiments, and sodas before sitting down at a table beneath the green canvas of a large shade umbrella. The lieutenant takes a healthy bite as Elliot Tucker first adds mustard to his hot dog. All right, Lieutenant. You're bribing me with a handsome lunch. What can I do for you? Uh, this is about an insurance policy. Oh, excellent. A round, clean-shaven face. His alert blue eyes framed by steel wire-rimmed glasses. It's about time you came to me. I can give you a package yeah, within your... Yeah, this meeting. is uh, an insurance policy that was already written. Oh, this is official business. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are two mystery writers, Ken Franklin and James Ferris. Your company wrote a policy on them? Now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. We'd like to cooperate with the police, but... If you want confidential information, I'm afraid... Oh, well, you... look, uh, I don't want to cause you any trouble. Maybe it would be more helpful if I got a court order. Instantly clear on the concept, Elliot Tucker stops chewing his hot dog in mid-bite. The insurance agent flexibly reassesses the circumstances, and ultimately, Lieutenant Columbo is furnished with all documents relevant to the life insurance policy held by Ken Franklin and the estate of James Ferris. Following Friday night, Ken Franklin's on a date with one of his girlfriends at the Curran Playhouse Theater in downtown San Diego. It's 9.30 p.m. 
A stage performance of the mystery thriller Death Trap has just finished, and the theater lobby is abuzz with happy patrons joyously refusing to call the night. The beautiful woman on Ken's arm, 22-year-old Ginger Kraus, has shoulder-length bleach blonde hair, almond-shaped green eyes, and a scattering of freckles dotting her rosy cheeks. Standing just shy of six feet tall, she has the poise and angular figure of either a runner or swimmer, probably both. Descending the grand staircase, Ken and Ginger discuss the play they just saw. I mean, it was simply marvelous. I was terrified. Oh, really? I had the whole thing figured out by the end of the first act. Well, you did. Further evidence of aquatics. At the back of her neck, bikini string tied in a dainty knot. Its two bright red strands retreat beneath her pastel yellow terry cloth of an off-the-shoulder dress, accenting her sun-brown skin. I was completely fooled. You must have a devious mind. No, dear. Sure, you're young. Always remember one thing, my love. The moment a man mentions a long-lost twin, you can inevitably know that it's going to be some impersonation. It's an old plot trick. Standing at a public payphone between the foot of the staircase and the nearest exit, Ken suggests dinner. Reaching into his pocket, Ken takes out a quarter as well as a printed matchbook from Del Vecchio's Trattoria. Lifting the receiver and wedging it under his chin, Ken holds the matchbook so his thumb underlines the Italian restaurant's phone number. Mr. Franklin! You! Lily Lasanka? Mr. Franklin! From Grant's Creek General Store. Ginger asks Ken. Who's that? Someone that should be somewhere else. Handing Ginger the receiver, Ken politely asks if she'll call Del Vecchio's, tell him it's for Ken Franklin, who's a regular, and see if they can squeeze him in at the last minute. Mr. Franklin! Hoping to squelch the sound of his name being broadcast throughout the entire city. Excuse me a moment. Ken gives a furtive wave to Lily as he leaves his sexy friend at the payphone and crosses the theater lobby a lobby in which, filled to capacity, Lily Lasanka cannot be ignored. The frumpy widow's shapeless, full-length dress is day-glow red, with huge white flowers randomly embroidered into its material. Ken sees Ms. Lasanka as a veritable fire engine with sirens wailing. As he bravely approaches, Lily leans in for a hug, which he deflects at length with a courteous handshake. Ms. Lasanka, <laughs> what a pleasant surprise. What brings you to the big city? Oh, I came in to do a little shopping. You, you like my dress? Oh, it, it's lovely. <laughs> See a play? <laughs> Lily looks over and sees Ken's date, Ginger Krauss, speaking easily on the payphone. She's a beauty, Mr. Franklin. Yes, she is. Uh, thank you. I haven't seen her before, have I? No, I don't believe you have. Well, it's... It's lovely to see you. I am. Uh... Affectionately, Lily takes Ken's hand in hers. I hope you won't think I'm being forward. <laughs> but is there any chance of uh, our having a drink together? Oh, I, I'd love to, really. But uh, see, the young lady and I are going to have late supper. His hand still firmly in her grip. I think you might want to cancel it. Just why would I want to do that? Because we really should have a discussion. <laughs> I have some other time. <laughs> the 45-year-old bachelor breaks free, but she grabs his jacket. All right. I suppose I'll have to find someone else to tell my story to. <laughs> it's a mystery story. Very interesting, really. It's all about this witness. <laughs> it's obvious to both. Lily now has Ken's full attention. Just wait here, I'll be right back. Anything you say, Mr. Franklin? Ken ditches Ginger Krause with a kiss and cab fare home. Later that evening, Ken and his consolation prize, Lily Lasanka, are at the Italian restaurant Del Vecchio's. They've just finished the main course, and Ken, a regular customer, describes the filet mignon smothered in sautéed mushrooms as typically delicious. Just then, the waiter brings dessert. Fresh, delicious strawberries nestled in an enormous bowl of vanilla whipped cream. Oh, oh, wow. oh I just can't resist strawberries. Oh, I'm glad you like them. <laughs> Sitting quietly across the table, considering his options, Ken watches her quietly as Lily listens to her gut instinct. <laughs> 
making me nervous. That's quite a stare. I'm sorry. I can't help it. You know, I've never seen you outside that store before. You're very lovely. May I call you Lily? Yes, please do. How did you enjoy the play tonight? No, I thought it was predictable. You? Oh, I like your books much more. That's very flattering. But you said something before about uh, about your story, or something about a, a witness. Oh yes. Well, actually, it's a um, true to life story. Well, the best kind. <laughs> it concerns your partner, Jim. Mm -hmm. What about him? Well, I read in the papers about his death, and I felt just terrible. Thank you. I felt just terrible because they said he was killed in his office. So they did. Well, in my story, you see, he couldn't have actually been killed in an office because he was um, somewhere else. Just for the moment, let's forget about your story. Let's, uh, let's talk about real life. It is simpler, isn't it? Much. I'll tell you honestly, Ken. I was very confused when I saw the papers because when you were in my store making a phone call the other day, mm -hmm. I wandered over to the side window to see if you had brought a lady with you. You didn't believe me when I said that I was alone. Oh, I believed you. It's just that I'm very interested in you, Ken. The manipulative Ken Franklin's face fades from modest surprise to aroused interest. Well, anyway, <laughs> you can imagine my surprise when I saw your partner. There he was, big as life, <laughs> sitting there in the front seat of your car. And that disturbed you, huh? Oh, not at that time. Only later. And then I debated with myself for days whether to come and see you or not. Why didn't you go to the police? Oh, Ken. I wouldn't want to get you into trouble. <laughs> oh, of course not. All right, Lily. Ken smiles. How much? I hope you don't think that that's the only... No, no, no. I don't think anything. I'll tell you something. I'm most grateful you came to me first. You know why? Because I think we can reach an equitable agreement. I do so admire your candor. <laughs> this isn't easy for me. A widow running a small country store trying to make ends meet. Oh, I can understand that. And I also recognize in you a woman of, of some breeding. I mean, you're not just a common blackmailer. I'm so glad you're understanding. Very well, Lily. How much for your silence? Fifteen thousand dollars. Lily fumbles her wine. I, oh, I, I know it's a lot, but that's all I'll ever ask for, honestly. And I'm a woman of my word. I know you are, and I respect you for that. You know what? In that spirit, I accept your terms. Agreed? <sighs> Agreed. <laughs> And I know you won't take offense when I say it's a pleasure doing business with you. No, no. My pleasure. <laughs> Ken plucks a whipped cream covered strawberry and holds it an inch from Lily's face. As if to seal the deal, Lily leans her head forward and takes it in her mouth, exchanging a flirtatious smile with the man feeding her. Wednesday, 12 noon, 10 miles northeast of downtown L.A., Ken's two-story house in Altadena is the location of his latest press interview. In his living room, Ken Franklin sits in a wing-back chair with his back to the wet bar. In front of Ken, slightly to his left, book reviewer Gloria Somerset sits in the other wing-back chair, holding a notepad and pen as she listens attentively to the wealthy bachelor. 
Hovering in their midst, photographer Harvey Palomino captures from multiple angles a successful author happy in his home, comfortable in his familiar beige corduroy jacket over a wine-colored turtleneck. Ken's 50-something maid, Mary Harrison, opens the door to a short, dark-haired man wearing a light brown trench coat, awkwardly carrying a large stack of Mrs. Melville novels. Yes? Is Mr. Franklin home? He's occupied at the moment. Who shall I say is calling? Uh, Lieutenant Colombo. Oh. Mrs. Harrison further opens the door. Well, won't you come in and wait? He steps in. He'll be with you shortly. The two exchange a pleasant smile. Then, closing the door, the quick-footed maid disappears down a hallway. Only a few more. Standing alone in the vestibule, Columbo notices just inside the front door two bottles of champagne and a pair of men's driving gloves on top of a black leather briefcase laid down on its side. Mr. Franklin, I think we're about finished. If you can bear one or two more photographs. Fire away. After all, your magazine was very kind to Franklin and Ferris during our lean years. That's uh, the second reason I granted the interview. Oh, what was the first? Why, the charm of the interviewer, of course. Columbo approaches the wet bar, but when he tries hoisting the stack of books onto its surface, Lieutenant accidentally drops one of the hard copies behind the bar. Ken turns around in his chair to see Columbo standing at the bar fumbling with the books. Yes, Lieutenant, is there something I can do for you? Oh, yeah, if, if, you, if you have a moment. That's about all I do have. As soon as I finish here, I'll be right with you. Is there anything else, Miss... Uh, may I call you Gloria? Please do. Uh, just one last question. I think our readers will want to know how the death of your partner will affect the Mrs. Melville books. I'm afraid when I buried Jim, I buried Mrs. Melville with him. Mm, I understand. But everyone will miss her so. Can't you write another one? Oh, I could, naturally, but what's the point? With Jim gone, there wouldn't be much reason. No, I'm afraid uh, Mrs. Melville has solved her last case. Actually, I've been seriously debating as to whether I ever want to write again. Oh, well, I hope you do. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Ken stands up. Now, if you don't mind. Huh? Of course. Gloria gets up and slings a brown leather purse over her right shoulder. Let's go, Harvey. She does not object when Ken rests a hand on the small of her back as he walks her to the front door. Perhaps under better circumstances, I... Uh, he looks askance at Columbo. Less harassed circumstances, I could give you a more detailed interview. Ken glides his hand up Gloria's back. Even in more depth. Mm, that'll be nice. Shall I call you? Yes, please do. Next week, huh? He lifts her hand and kisses it. Goodbye. Then she walks out to her car. As he starts to close the door, photographer Harvey Palomino, lugging his equipment in tow. Oh, sorry, Harvey. Thank you. Hurries to keep up as Ken patiently holds open the door. Thanks very much. Ken closes the door and turns around to face Columbo. All right, Lieutenant, what can I do for you? Well, I brought back your books. Well, that's fine. Just put them over there on the table. Yeah. Uh... The detective carefully begins moving the books to the other table. Uh, sure, I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed them. I think they're the most terrific boy I want to, and... Oh, listen, I'll come back. I'll make two trips on this. But the, the lady detective, what a character, what a brain, and what logic, the way she figures it out. Lieutenant, I'd love to sit down and discuss literature with you, but I was on my way out. Oh. Ken puts on his gloves, grabs the champagne in his right hand, holding both bottles by the necks, and in his left hand, he carries the black leather briefcase. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bother you. Are uh, you going someplace special? Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm on my way down to my cabin for a rest. Would you like an itinerary? Hey, I'm sorry. In another room, Mary Harrison begins vacuuming. I'm making a pest of myself. No. Yes, yes, I am. I know it's because I keep asking these questions, but I'll tell you. I can't help myself. It's a habit. I take it you're not going alone. Whatever gave you that idea? I noticed the two bottles of champagne. Oh, those? Oh, I'm quite capable of drinking those two bottles and a good deal more without any help. Now, if you'll excuse me, Lieutenant. Yeah, uh, listen, unless you just want to take a second to know how we're progressing on your partner's list. Oh? 
Anything concrete? No, not a thing. Just like you predicted. Everyone said they never even heard of James Ferris. That's just as I expected. Well, it was lovely to chat with you, Lieutenant. As Ken walks out of his two-story mansion, the detective accompanies him out to his car in the driveway. Oh, Mr. Franklin? Yeah. Do you have a minute? Is it important? Well, it could be. You see, I was checking the, uh, the phone company records in San Diego. Ken thinks back two weeks prior. Now, why would you want to do that, Lieutenant? Calling Joanna from Grants Creek General Store while Jim waited out in the car. Oh, I have to do that. You know, that's part of my job. I got to tie up all those loose ends. Anyway, on the day of the murder, there was a record of a call from the cabin. It was a call to the Ferris House in Los Angeles. I see. And now you're wondering whether I can explain that. Is that right? Oh, I'm sure you can. Oh, you're right, I can. But you see, you would have saved both you and me a great deal of trouble if you'd checked with Joanna Ferris first. She would have explained to you that I'd spoken to her from my cabin, telling her that Jim and I had patched up our differences. Oh, what do you mean by differences? Uh... Well, you see, ironing out any difficulties in a separation is never easy. And I knew Joanna would be concerned, and I wanted to put her mind at ease. Can you understand that? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's understandable. Oh, yeah. Oh, fine. Yeah. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Right. Good. And listen, uh, enjoy your trip. Thanks very much. Ken puts his briefcase and champagne in the back of his car. Gets in the driver's seat and closes the door. Drive carefully. Don't worry, Lieutenant. You can count on it. Columbo steps back from the car as Ken drives off in a huff. Sitting in his parked car, Columbo grabs his copy of Ken and Jim's life insurance policy. He quickly skims down to the financial holding section, which reveals Ken Franklin's checking and savings accounts are both at Crocker Bank. When the lieutenant discreetly drives by the closest branch near the 210 freeway, it's no surprise seeing Ken's royal blue Mercedes parked in the lot. Three hours and 150 miles later, Ken pulls his royal blue Mercedes convertible into the gravel-covered parking lot of Grants Creek General Store. Ken Franklin walks in triumphantly, carrying a black leather briefcase and the two champagne bottles. And here you are. <laughs> Bearing gifts. Putting his briefcase up on the counter, he pushes it two inches closer to her. Then, with a bottle in each hand, and more gifts. A double serving of champagne alongside a briefcase containing fifteen thousand dollars. Why, Mr. Franklin, how lovely. <laughs> Ken. Yes, of course, Ken. Now, Lily, let me ask you a simple question. You up to making a nice quiet dinner for two tonight? Her enthusiastic yes. And by 9 o'clock that night, an equally delicious home-cooked dinner, after which the two enjoy a bottle of champagne at Lily's dining room table. Here's to prosperity. Four little snaps at the side of her blue dress reveal a previously unseen thigh-high slit. Um, romance? <laughs> <laughs> the daily double. <laughs> Leaning back in her chair comfortably and crossing her one bare leg over the other, she dangles seductively a bright blue two-inch heel from the tip of her big toe. With an approving smile, Ken sips his champagne. I must say, Lily, that was a magnificent meal. Where did you learn to cook so well? My late husband. May he rest in peace was a professional chef. Wonderful man. <laughs> he taught me all I know. Well, he taught you well. Thank you, sir. Lily finishes her champagne and holds out an empty glass. Refill. Oh, sorry. Ken pours about three drops. The bottle is empty. Oh. <laughs> You're allowed. He stands up, crosses the tiny room in two steps. Let's open another one. Dare we? Yeah, we not. And begins uncorking mm. as Lily remains seated, enjoying the view. Of course, the good thing about plastic corks is they don't require a corkscrew or a wine opener, which Ken was pretty sure Lily would not have. 
Here we go. Happy New Year! The bottle erupts in bubbly foam. Quick, the glass. Ken hurries it to her, leaning in close, aiming the foam into her glass. Success with no spillage, Ken relaxes and pours his own glass. Lily can feel her cheeks flush. Delicious. But I'm afraid I'm getting a little tipsy. What's wrong with that? I don't know if I can trust you. Now, is there any reason not to? Lily, if I make you uncomfortable, I can always leave. He starts for the door, but she stops him with an affectionate hand on his wrist. No, please. I do enjoy your company. Then he leans down close. Their mouths find each other, and the two kiss slowly, sensually. Glancing out her kitchen window, Ken notices Lily, like most residents of Grants Creek, has a rowboat. You know what we should do? Why? It's such a beautiful night. We should row out to the center of the lake and go for a swim. Mm, sounds nice. Mm, it is nice. Shall we? Better not. Why not? I trust you, Ken. Really. But we all have our dark sides, don't we? It just wouldn't be very intelligent of me to be alone with you in a small boat. After all, you might start having second thoughts about the money. Ken sits back in his chair, dejected. I wish you hadn't said that, Lily. His sad face, the victimized expression of a man who's been hurt deeply. That kind of talk hurts me deeply. I'm going to tell you something, and I shouldn't. But I'll tell you why, because I trust you. I was prepared to give you considerably more than you asked for. 15,000, I mean, I've lost that much gambling in one night. She stares forward defiantly. Well, it certainly is a great deal of money to me. Ken gets up, walks over to the kitchen counter, and calmly opens the black leather briefcase. Standing at the counter with his back to Lily, he stares at the eight neatly arranged bundles of money amounting to $15,000. What do you think you'll, uh, you'll do with all of it? I don't know. Lily gets up and walks into the kitchen where Ken is standing with all the money. I'll put it in the bank, I guess. She picks up one of the bundles. But not right away. Enjoys the feel of all this cash and it all belongs to Lily. Oh, I just want to look at it for a while. <laughs> With a smile, Ken runs a finger along her wrist, then walks back into the dining room. Better be careful. Someone might, uh, rob you. I'll just keep it for a day or two. I've never seen so much money in my life. He takes the dinner napkin and wraps it around the neck of an empty champagne bottle. Maybe... Maybe you could take a, a trip somewhere, huh? I may. I've always wanted to go on a cruise. Oh, cruises. It's so romantic. Did I tell you that my late husband was in the Merchant Marines? Is that a fact? They're the ones who taught him how to cook. I almost wish he were here now. He casually picks up the empty champagne bottle and comes up behind Lily. He could share this with me. Or maybe we can do the next best thing. A swift blow to her skull and she drops to the floor. About an hour later, wearing only his t-shirt over a pair of red swim trunks, just as he had suggested earlier, Ken is in Lily's small boat rowing out toward the middle of Grant's Creek. Inside the boat, near his feet, the lifeless body of Lily Lasanka, alongside two empty champagne bottles. Once he's far enough out, Ken stops rowing and stows the oars. Bracing his feet for leverage, Ken hoists Lily's body up onto the edge of the tiny rowboat, then shoves her overboard into the black water. He holds the champagne bottle beneath the surface till it fills with water, then lets go, allowing it to sink to the bottom. He takes a second champagne bottle and does same. Careful to keep his balance, Ken stands up in the tiny boat and begins rocking side to side, 
left to right, side to side, increasing in speed, left to right, side to side. Once he gets enough momentum, he fully capsizes it with Lily's body floating somewhere nearby. By the time he swims back to shore, it's just after midnight, and under the cover of darkness, he collects his clothes, gets back in his car, and discreetly drives back to his cabin. Early the following morning, all of Grant's Creek is abuzz as local residents awaken to news of a death in their tight-knit community. Grant's Creek General Store never opened this morning, and a grim sadness develops when Sheriff's Department scuba divers dredge the dead body of an adult Caucasian woman, apparently in her 40s. A small rowboat, capsized, is also retrieved and inventoried as estate property. In the vacant lot adjacent to the general store, a group of a dozen or so inquisitive locals gather to observe the scuba divers, try to interpret sheriff radio chatter, and compare notes as to who knows what. The group seems comprised mostly of 60-something amateur fishermen dressed in various combinations of denim, polyester, and flannel. Baseball caps and cowboy hats, nearly everyone wears something on his head. Who did you say it is? That was a local kind of drowning. Fitting right in, the youngest member of the group, a clean-shaven 40-something with short blonde hair. Ken Franklin wears a Greek fisherman cap with a yellow windbreaker over a loose-fitting pair of faded blue jeans and white boat shoes. With a wicker tackle box slung over his right shoulder, he carries in his left hand a top-of-the-line St. Croix freshwater fishing rod. Coming up on 6.30 a.m. now as Ken walks back to his Mercedes convertible, loads his gear into the passenger seat, and returns to his cabin. When he arrives 15 minutes later, he enters through the side kitchen door, which he always leaves unlocked when he's in town. He leans his fishing pole in a corner near the sink. He takes the tackle box off his shoulder and puts it on the counter. Then he spots Columbo's business card on his refrigerator. But Ken did not put that. Spinning on his heel, Ken looks out his back window, which overlooks the water, and he sees Columbo with an unlit cigar standing on his back patio deck. Morning. How long has he been here? He must have come in through the kitchen. The lieutenant opens the sliding glass door and walks in, while Ken exits the kitchen, intercepting Columbo in the living room. Wow, Lieutenant Columbo. The two men shake hands. I must say you turn up at the oddest times, don't you? The detective nods toward Ken's kitchen door. Hope you don't mind my coming in that way, you know, but the door was open and I just let myself in. No, no. How'd you get here? By magic carpet? I didn't see your car outside. Oh, no, I pulled around back and I put it in the shade. You know, the sun raises hell with the paint. Oh, sensible. Well, what brings you up here to the wilds? Well, I'll tell you, I heard you and Mrs. Ferris talk so much about this place and you made it sound so terrific and believe me, uh... They step outside and enjoy this captivating view. Majestic hills blanketed in healthy forests of lush terrain, framing the expansive, glistening water stretching away miles in every direction. You know, since I got a two-week vacation coming up, I said to myself, go on down there and check out the area. Look to see. Maybe you can rent a cabin. Lieutenant, you're not going to tell me you drove down here just to look for a vacation spot, are you? Why else would I come? You're wasting your time. I have a feeling the cabins in this neck of the woods are pretty much out of your price range anyway. Most of them are, are rented for the season. Oh, gee whiz, that's, that's too bad. Resting his hands on a simple wooden guardrail, Columbo says, Gosh, my wife is going to be disappointed. Well, it was a nice ride anyhow. Yes, yeah, a lovely drive. Except for that bottleneck down the road. What was that all about? Oh, there was a drowning. Well, what was it, a fisherman? Well, I heard someone say it was a local woman. Ah, uh, a Miss Lasanka or something? Like something like that, yeah. Yeah. Did you know her? Not really, no. I was just wondering, because when I was in the kitchen before, I noticed a grocery box with oh, her name I on it. Oh, I occasionally buy supplies there, sure, like anyone else who lives around here. Mm. I think she was the one that drowned. Yeah. Because I uh, stopped by the grocery store on the way here to pick up some cigars. I noticed it was closed and... It, Cops cars around. Facing Columbo, Ken stands confidently with his arms crossed, his elbows pulling slightly at the nylon fabric of his yellow windbreaker. Well, if it was her, I... I'd be very sorry. She was always very friendly. Yeah, 
That's a shame. Oh, you did know her. Ken rolls his eyes. Lieutenant, I know a lot of people out really knowing them. You know, like barbers, waitresses, parking lot attendants. Even the cop on the beat, don't you? Yeah. yeah I do. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, though, I, I, people are strange. You know, I can't figure them out. Why a woman goes out on a lake all by herself before the light comes up? Oh, there's nothing unusual about that. A lot of us go out early. It's peaceful and kind of makes you feel like you're plugged into nature. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Three feet to the left, Ken's red swim trunks hang dry in the sun. Well, say, listen, look, you came down here to get away from things, and I'm just taking up your time. I didn't mean to bother you. No, 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 it's no bother at all. Seizing the opportunity, Ken opens a sliding glass door and, with a polite flourish, steers Columbo back into the living room. Say, I'd, I'd be more than glad to let you have a bathing suit, but uh, you don't look like the athletic type to me. Well, it's uh, my wife that's the athlete. Oh? Yeah. So you don't think I'm going to be able to find a cabin to rent, huh? Avoiding the kitchen, Ken escorts his guests to the front door. Best bet is to go down and check with some of the local real estate people. Uh huh. Because I think it'd be fun to be neighbors for a couple of weeks. Huh? Yeah. Say, what kind of nightlife do you have around here? Nightlife? None. No partying? Just sleep and crickets. See, I was just wondering because, you know, I didn't want to barge in on you today unannounced. Well, I'll follow you. No, well, last night I called to tell you that I was coming. But there was no one at home. Cordially, the detective leaves Ken Franklin at his front door and walks back to his car parked in the shade. On his way back to the main highway, Columbo pulls into the crowded parking area of Grants Creek General Store. An assortment of cars owned and operated by Sheriff's Department, medical personnel, press reporters, and the dark gray coroner's van, as well as three or four personally owned vehicles. A busy scene with all sorts of people in and out of the store and the nearby boating dock. Uniformed sheriff deputies confer with scuba divers as they stow their gear. Reporters scribble in their notebooks, and a handful of local residents mill about promoting theories, guesswork, and speculation. Getting out of his car, Columbo notices there's no crime scene tape and no fingerprints or forensics personnel. He approaches the general store's main entrance. Are you a reporter? Columbo turns around to see the uniform of the San Diego Sheriff's Department worn by a 50-something white guy with sunglasses. With a small brass star on his collar, Division Chief Schuster stands six feet tall on a muscular, lean, 190-pound frame. Uh, no, uh, uh Lieutenant, uh, Columbo, uh, police. Columbo produces his own badge and police ID. L.A. Hands it to Chief Schuster. Schuster holds the wallet in his hand. L.A.P.D. Reads it quickly, then hands it back to Columbo. Yeah. What brings you down here, Lieutenant? Well, I'm working on a case. Uh, listen, this is not really my jurisdiction, but uh, you mind if I browse around? Well, help yourself, Lieutenant. Always glad to cooperate. A quick nod, Columbo thanks Schuster, turns around and enters the general store. An impromptu press briefing summer, as an agitated yes, sheriff deputy, deputy in his mid-thirties fields questions to the best of his ability. Does she have a bruise on her head? How did you know that, Ben? Oh, come on, Sergeant. Doc Webster told us. All right, so there was a bruise. Probably a result of the boat capsizing and rendering her unconscious. Any indication the lady was under the influence? I can't ascertain that until we see an autopsy report. The doctor's working on that right now. Sounds like drinking to me. Could she swim? How in the world would I know a thing like that? I wasn't married to the Got lady. Any living relatives? I don't think so. Somebody said she was a widow. What about the rowboat? Rowboat? What about it? Well, who did it belong to? Where did it come from? It belonged to the deceased. I've got witnesses. Walking around thoughtfully, Columbo scans the general store for any possible evidence in the deaths of Jim Ferris or Lily Lysenka. A small hallway off to the side with a posted sign above heralding the public payphone. Then it hits him. Here he is three miles from Ken's cabin, and Columbo instantly realizes how Ken worked the phones that Saturday morning he killed Jim Ferris. Ken could have called Joanna from this payphone saying he was calling from his cabin, which would then mask Jim's call from his cabin. To the left of the payphone, 
A full-length, dark orange curtain affords privacy to an adjacent room. The detective steps through the curtain to find he is standing in the personal living space of the late Lily Lasanka. On his left, a colorful plastic Hawaiian lei adorns the top of a simple alarm clock radio in the corner, and to his right, a wine-colored couch with two dissimilar blankets folded neatly on an end table. Positioned in front of the sofa, a small flat footlocker doubles as a coffee table. Over near the kitchen, he observes a modest dining room table flanked by two metal chairs. The table has a small built-in drawer which Columbo opens, empty, and then he closes it. He walks into the kitchen to find coupons stuck to the refrigerator. On a drying rack near the sink, an assortment of silverware, two clean plates, and two wine glasses suggest Lilith Sanka's last meal included company. Also, someone emptied the trash but did not put in a new bag. Would Lily do that? He walks back to the wine-colored sofa in the living room, opens the footlocker in front of it. Extra blankets and jackets, searching for which reveals nothing interesting, no hidden cash, weapons, or jewelry. Then he spots a small white item on the floor in a corner behind one of the dining room chairs. He bends down and picks up a plastic, mushroom-shaped item about the size of a champagne cork. It is a champagne cork, which he confirms by holding to his nose and inhaling the faint smell of fruit. The lieutenant takes one last look around the small living quarters of the late Lily Lasanka. He pockets the cork, exits through the dark orange curtain, passes the payphone, and returns to the commotion of the general store. He scans the large room and sees pretty much what you'd expect from a general store. Bags of potato chips, cans of soup, various sized containers of salt, vinegar, cooking oil. Some fresh air last night. This is all conjecture, gentlemen. I mean, there's no way of telling. Maybe she did. Who knows? Yellow metal cans of lighter fluid and aerosol spray cans of mosquito repellent. A fake video camera mounted conspicuously above the door frame. With a blinking red light, its glass lens aimed directly at the cash register in hopes of discouraging bad behavior. It's also possible that she had a heart seizure or she got dizzy. And you think it was an accident? I certainly don't think it was foul play. You're going to be in your office this afternoon? At far Absolutely. right, a bulletin board above a rack of books and magazines. He reads its largest two postings. Notice private boat owners with a list of fees. The second notice, rifle range, Grants Creek Sportsman's Club. Rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Absolutely. How long was she in the water, Sergeant? Oh, I don't know. We'll wait till we get the report. We're starting to cover the same old... He looks at the small there, bookshelf beneath. Me in my a few magazines, TV Guide, Reader's Digest, and a hardcover novel. The lieutenant grabs it and reads the cover. Mrs. Melville, Prescription Murder, by James Ferris and Ken Franklin. He opens the first few pages and locates a handwritten inscription. To my lily, love always, Ken. Excitedly, Columbo takes the book outside and locates that division chief, Chief Schuster. Respectful of jurisdiction, the lieutenant explains his case, which started in Los Angeles when the suspect, L.A. resident Ken Franklin, lured his victim, L.A. resident Jim Ferris, out of Los Angeles to commit the murder in San Diego. Furthermore, with the book and the plastic champagne cork, Columbo's got a strong case, admittedly circumstantial, that Lily Lasanka's death will lead directly back to Ken Franklin. Chief Schuster agrees Columbo has already provided ample justification and unless something radically changes, Schuster has signature authority which he will now exercise to transfer any and all evidence over to LAPD with Lieutenant Columbo as acting custodian. Off the record, Schuster confides this is a win-win as, for San Diego Sheriff's Department, this instantly improves their solve rate by two homicides. Their smiles genuine, the two lawmen shake hands and part company. A big victory in Columbo's favor, no doubt, but in itself not quite sufficient for an arrest. Columbo goes back inside the general store and uses the payphone to call Joanna Ferris. He tells her he has new information he'd like to go over with her in person, and the two agree to meet at her house later this afternoon between 5 and 6 p.m. Driving nearly as fast as his Peugeot 403 convertible will go, the lieutenant makes the drive back to Los Angeles in about three and a half hours. After a delicious late lunch at International House of Pancakes, 
Toward the end of business day, the lieutenant stops in briefly at Crocker Bank and speaks with bank manager Beverly Pierce. Mindful to keep his appointment, one hour later, the detective is sitting in the home of Joanna Ferris, speaking to the widow in the comfort of her living room. Tactfully, he reviews Ken Franklin's suspicious actions since that terrible morning Joanna listened telephonically to her husband's murder. The detective tells her about the seemingly coincidental boating death of Lily Lasanka. He hands Joanna the plastic champagne cork. It's possible Ken Franklin might have romantically seduced her to lower Lily's guard before killing her. Columbo hands her the hardcover book he found at Grant's Creek General Store, opens it to the third or fourth page of his handwritten inscription. To my Lily, love always, Ken. I still don't know what this means. It means that he knew her. It means that he knew her not casually the way he said. It means that he knew her reasonably well. All right. You've got a romantic inscription in a book and a champagne cork. Now, what does that prove? By itself, it doesn't prove anything. But once you assume that Franklin committed these crimes, everything fits together. I just can't believe it. I've known Ken too long. He's not a murderer. Mrs. Ferris, it wouldn't make any difference if you knew him for a hundred years. That wouldn't change anything. This man, Franklin, took your husband's life. She flinches under the enormity of Columbo's statement. The lieutenant puts a cigar in his mouth, checks his pockets, comes up empty. Do you have a match? Angry, scared, and confused, she stands, takes a fancy metal box off top of the TV set. Help yourself. And slaps it down on the coffee table near Columbo. I don't smoke. With a sigh, Columbo opens the box's lid. He grabs a book of matches, as Joanna says. It doesn't make sense, Lieutenant. Ken has an alibi. What's his motive? I told you how he could have worked the phone. He gestures with the matches. Now, his motive is the insurance money. He needed cash. He spent money like a drunken sailor. He had two houses. He's got paintings. He's got women. Columbo opens the matchbook. He's got... And notices a handwritten inscription. What? Jack and Jill went up the hill. Did Jack kill Jill? If so, find out why. From across the room, the lieutenant just looks at her. Jim. One of his story ideas. Still seated, Joanna lovingly holds the book in her lap, thumbs through its pages, skims its words. Jim... Her Jim wrote this book. Lieutenant, if Ken killed my husband, then why did he murder Miss Lasanka? Well, it's my hunch that she knew something. Maybe she saw them together and she tried to blackmail him. But that's pure guesswork, isn't it? No, ma'am, it's not. Not quite. I checked the bank. Yesterday he took out $15,000. Today he put it back in again. Now, why in the world would he do that? All right. I'm still not convinced, but let's say I'll go along. What happens now? I don't know. But I've got a pretty strong circumstantial case. It's just not enough. If I had one piece of hard evidence, I could nail this fella. But you don't. That's right, ma'am. I don't. That's why I'm here. Maybe you can give it to me. Me? You know both of these fellas very well. I want you to tell me about him. Anything. Just talk. Whatever comes into your mind. Kind of like analysis without the couch. Would you like a little coffee first? That'd be fine. Okay. She stands up and walks over to the kitchen. I don't know what you're looking for, but here goes. They met in a typewriter shop of all places. Jim had broken a key and Ken needed a ribbon. Does that help? I keep going. Well... She takes the coffee out of the freezer, closes it, and turns on the kitchen sink. I told you a lot about Jim. He was brilliant, really. He'd wake up in the middle of the night with ideas, always throwing off sparks. I remember he even did it on our honeymoon. Funny thing is, it, Ken didn't even talk about the books unless he was on television. Thank you.
following morning, Ken drives west on Wilshire, then pulls into the parking lot of the Hansford Professional Building in West L.A. It's moving day, and Ken Franklin has arranged to have his property removed two weeks before, their, before his office lease expires. Wearing a dark blue blazer and a yellow ascot, Ken parks in front of the truck, whose placard he recognizes from when he reserved their services, McCormick Moving Van and Storage. Ken gets out of his royal blue Mercedes and walks up to the moving truck's passenger side. This a truck's gonna move my stuff out of Sweet 1003? Yeah. You almost finished? Haven't started. What do you mean you haven't started? I'm only the driver, mister. Ask the other two guys. They've been in there a half an hour already. Half hour? Ken hurries into the building and takes the elevator up to the 10th floor. As the elevator door is open, Ken is greeted by three uniformed LAPD officers standing guard in the hallway. And off to the side, two furniture movers stand talking to each other. Angry, he storms into suite 1003 to find Columbo sitting at a desk, smoking a cigar, reading a hardcover book. Columbo! Furious, Ken Franklin stands on Columbo's side of the desk, leaning his proprietary hand on its corner. Hi, Mr. Franklin. Just finishing up this last Melville mystery. I didn't get a chance the other day. All right, now what are you doing here? Well, I'm waiting for you. I happen to be in the neighborhood. Oh, you're always in the neighborhood. Ken angrily points outside the office door. And you tell me what right you've got to keep those movers out of this office? Ken walks around to the front of the desk, stands dominantly with his feet spread, hands on his hips. He looks down at the lieutenant, who calmly puts the book aside and looks back up at Ken. Oh, listen, I'm sorry about that. It's just, you know what I thought? I thought you and I should talk alone. Turning his back on the detective, Ken stares out the window overlooking West L.A., ten stories below. You and I have nothing to talk about. Yes, we do, Mr. Franklin. Columbo stands up behind the desk. We have something to talk about. Talks to the back of Ken's head. I'm here to arrest you for the murder of your partner. Ken turns around and looks at him. What? Now, it's my duty to inform you of your constitutional rights. Oh, you cut that drivel. I've written that stuff so many times, I know it by heart. And what is this nonsense? You're going to arrest me. Stepping out from behind the desk. Come on, Mr. Franklin, why don't you make a statement and save us both a lot of trouble? Columbo walks over to Ken, where the two men stand facing each other straight on. You know, I've really got you. Sarcastically. All right, Lieutenant. Ken extends both hands forward, palms down. You got me. I'm your prisoner here. Clamp the irons on me. Do you want to give me a dime first so I can phone my attorney? Because I promise you I'm going to sue you and your department for false arrest and defamation of character. I kind of knew it right from the start. There's nothing definite. There's a lot of little things. Little things. Driving back from San Diego on the day of the murder instead of taking a plane. The open mail. Never showing any genuine emotion for a man that you worked with for ten years. <laughs> with that, you know what they're going to do? They're going to laugh you right out of court. But they're not going to laugh at the insurance policy, are they? I've got a photostatic copy of it here in my pocket. And he pulls it out, holding his copy of the policy in his left hand. They're going to laugh at the fact that he withdrew $15,000, put it back the next day. As he gestures with his cigar in his right. I've got the book that you gave to Miss Lasanka with your signature in it. You expect to get a true bill of indictment on that trivia? Franklin casually steps behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Takes a seat, reclining confidently, clasping hands beneath a clean-shaven jaw. I was down in San Diego. So was your partner. That's a provocative statement. Can you prove that? Yes. Not with the witness, because you killed the witness. Standing in front of the desk, the detective taps cigar ashes into a black plastic ashtray. But I got another way to prove it. Will you enlighten me? I must say I enjoy watching a man raise without any cards in his hand. Resting both hands on the front of the desk with a cigar in his left hand. You know what, Ken? Columbo looks Ken square in the eye. I'm going to tell you the truth. For a while there, I never thought I was going to get you. Believe me, you had me going in such circles. Takes four steps back. I couldn't figure it out. Still facing Ken, sits down on the stool, eagerly tapping a finger to his own head. Suddenly I thought of something. How clever that first murder was. The phone gimmick. Working late in the office. Brilliant. Oh, you awarding gold medals today? Yes. Pointing a cigar at Ken. For the first one. Not for the second one. That was sloppy. Mrs. Melville, she'd have been very disappointed. Well, come on, get to the climax, Lieutenant. You're talking to a writer. Am I? That's not what I heard. And that's the key, that you're not a writer. Standing up, Columbo takes four steps forward. 
When Mrs. Ferris told me that you didn't contribute to the writing... Again, leaning both hands on the desk, Columbo looks Ken in the eye. ...that her husband did all the work. That's a lie. I had to say to myself, how could a man with no talent for mysteries make up such a clever murder? If you were that genius, you'd be able to write your own books. Ken remains seated, smugly unperturbed, with his legs crossed and his hands clasped. Go ahead, I'm fascinated. As boring as it may be. Then I got it. The first one, the clever one, that wasn't yours. The second one, the sloppy one, that was yours. But not the first. Oh? And whose idea was that, then? Your partner's. The detective glides behind the desk. Had to be. Behind Ken's chair. And his wife told me how conscientious he was. Columbo opens the file cabinet and removes a small, flat, cardboard box containing business cards, notes, documents, envelopes, and takeout menus. You know, the way he used to write down his ideas on every odd scrap of paper, backs of matches, whatever ah, it was. Ah, so that's why you wouldn't let the movies in. From the cardboard box, Columbo removes a boarding pass from Air East Airlines. Well, I had to rummage around here before they emptied everything out. Standing over the seated author, Columbo shows Ken handwritten notes scribbled on the back of the paper sleeve. Is this your partner's handwriting? Well, I think I can prove it is. Maybe I ought to read this to you. Idea for a Melville book, perfect alibi. A wants to kill B. Drives B to a remote house and has him call his wife in city. Tells her he's working late at the office. Bang, bang. With a painful smile. Ken stares at the floor, his breathing accelerated, a noticeable pulse on his forehead. Sound familiar? That's the plot you used. Practically word for word. Should I read some more? No. A man defeated, involuntarily, Ken's eyes close. Officer, with this, I think I got a conviction, don't you? Grinning like an idiot, Ken looks up at the detective. You gotta admit I had you going for a while now, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> you want to know the irony of all of it? That is my idea. I mean, a really good one I ever had. Ken stands compliantly, putting his hands behind his back. I must have told it to Jim over five years ago. <laughs> Whoever thought that idiot would write it down? as the uniformed officer applies handcuffs, reads the suspect his rights, and escorts him downstairs to the waiting squad car. The detective collects his personal belongings and heads for the door. Stops, turns around, goes back to the desk and picks up the Mrs. Melville book and continues reading as he exits the office. We hope you've enjoyed this spoken word audio drama of Columbo, Murder by the Book. Based on the character Columbo by Richard Levinson and William Link. Columbo, Murder by the Book. Original TV air date, September 15, 1971. Directed by Steven Spielberg. Written by Steven Bochco. Film editing by John Kaufman. Music composed by Billy Goldenberg. Featuring the original Columbo theme by Henry Mancini. Supervising Sound Editor, David H. Moriarty. Featuring the voices of Peter Falk as Detective Columbo, Jack Cassidy as Ken Franklin, Rosemary Forsyth as Joanna Ferris, Martin Milner as Jim Ferris, Barbara Colby as Lily Lasanka, Lynette Metty as Gloria Somerset, and Bernie Cuby as Elliot Tucker. This spoken word audio drama independently produced at Project Wasabi Studios, Hollywood, California, 90028. Project Wasabi gratefully acknowledges additional music tracks provided by YouTube Creative Commons. The following tracks, Seventh Floor Tango, Righteous, Lurking, and Sunday Plans, composed and performed by Silent Partner. Desert City, composed and performed by Kevin McLeod. Technical credits, 
This spoken word audio drama first published on YouTube April 20th, 2017. All supplemental narration recorded with the iPhone 4 using the sound app Recorder HQ. Edited on Windows 10 using the sound editing software Acoustica iMix and Audacity. Supplemental narration, editing, and sound effects produced by Brian Newberry. This concludes Project Wasabi's spoken word audio drama of Columbo, Murder by the Book. For additional free spoken word audio dramas, visit us online at projectwasabi.com. Speaking to you from Hollywood, California, I'm Brian Newberry. On behalf of Project Wasabi, thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.